Can you start? Yes, we can start. Good evening, all. Today, uh, we are starting the uh, pediatric PG uh, class of uh, 2022, which is uh, uh, chaired by uh, IAP Calicut. Name is Academia 2022. So, uh, after the uh, uh, arrive after the starting of COVID-19, we are conducting a regular PG program under AFP Calcium. And after the last session, now we are restarting the new session. So first of all, I welcome uh, the Calicut AFP President uh, Mohandas sir to the program. Then we have uh, the, our secretary, Dr. Ajay. And uh, the today's speaker is uh, one of the stalwarts in the pediatric and a great teacher, Vijay Kumar sir. Who is always uh, teach all, all the uh, last year and all the year endocrinology in a very simple manner. Uh, and uh, we are blessed uh, so that our first class itself started with the Jacob Master's class. And he is the AP Kerala president right now. He is looking at uh, uh, HOD of Pediatrics in Manjari Medical College. So, also, I welcome all the uh, PGs who are very interestingly uh, participating in this program. We have more than 60 participants right now itself and starting itself. So it shows the enthusiasm of the PGs in our program. So I welcome uh, which, uh, Mohandas sir to introduce the speaker and to uh, tell a few words. Thank you. Uh, respected uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar, President IAP Kerala State and also today's speaker. BK Parvati Madam, Senior Pediatrician and the past IAP President Kerala State. Dear friends, so today we are uh, starting the uh, academic program for postgraduates, which we were conducting last year also, which had attracted a, a very large uh, number of uh, uh, postgraduates. Uh, last year we had uh, roughly 500 and more uh, attendees uh, in sessions, various sessions. And uh, this year we are starting with uh, pediatric endocrinology. And uh, the class is being taken by another than Dr. Vijay Kumar, who is professor and head of the department, Government Medical College, Manjeri, right now. And he is the president. IAP Kerala State, who is uh, a pioneer in pediatric endocrinology in Kerala. He has started the first pediatric endocrinology clinic in Kerala in Government Medical College, uh, Calicut. 
which uh, usually we see uh, more than 100 uh, patients every week uh, uh, which is a single day clinic uh, weekly clinic and uh, we had a large number of cohorts with uh, various pediatric endocrinology problems and a very good follow up and this experience over the last uh, more than 12 years uh, in, in the field of pediatric endocrinology uh, which he is going to share with uh, the post graduates all over india so i would like to welcome dr vijay kumar to start his class and at this outset i would like to wish uh, a warm birthday wishes to him today happens to be his birthday also and uh, all of you uh, can also wish as a message uh, in the chat box uh, welcome dr vijay kumar and uh, you can start the session thank you dr mohandas can you hear me yes yes and the slide is visible yes sir yes full screen aata hai ha ha okay okay yes sir okay yes. thank you mohandas for the nice introduction today we are starting restarting our pg clinic of this year and the first talk happened to be endocrinology and i hope that there is some old students are there in this gathering so some of the questions will be almost similar because this this first class we will discuss the basics of pediatric endocrinology so the questions are almost similar to the last as uh, some of the questions we have changed so the pediatric endocrinology the first section is growth disorders the most important part in pediatric endocrinology is the assessment of the linear growth weight and how to uh, how to plot it in a growth chart and how to follow up so that is the most important part if you know how to take height length and, and how to collect the previous records and how to plot it in a growth chart and how to assess it then at least part 50% of pediatric endocrinology is over so you can diagnose most of the cases by just looking at the growth chart and follow following of the child so i'll go to the first question so if you have pen and pencil you can just take down that some of the height weight all these measurements and all and if you have growth chart with you you can even plot it the question one is the usual question that is seen in oski during our previous uh, oski stations there will be one or two stations with growth chart so i have taken this question from old oski station now unfortunately because of the covid era the, there is no oski stations only the theory the questions are there no man stations are there so at least within few months we can go back to our old era pre covid era so here the 9 year old boy presented with complaints of not gaining enough height he was the only child of non consanguineous parents and his weight birth weight is 3.5 kg so note that he is having a normal birth weight he was having history of prolonged jaundice in the neonatal period requiring phototherapy he is having good scholastic performance and no history of any chronic systemic illness his father's height is 170 cm and mother's height is 154 cm anthropometric measurements of this child is as follows his height is 96 cm weight is 20 kg upper segment lower segment ratio is 1 is to 1 his bone age is 3 year so you can just note all this note down all these points the question is plot the parameters in the given growth chart and assess height age and weight age what is your comment assess mid parental height and plot in the growth chart plot the target range what is your interpretation third question is what are the differential diagnosis how will you plan further investigations fourth question comment about his bone age how will you assess bone age so this is the growth chart given to you 
is he is a 9 year old boy his age is exactly 9 year 4 year is otherwise you have to write suppose 9 year 4 months and all he have to write like that only 9 year 4 months and you have to plot in the growth chart we can take blue growth chart of the iap so height is 96 cm so i have plotted the height you can see that height is well below the third centile and his weight is 20 kg so just a dot so what is your comment regarding the weight the weight is at third centile just touching the third centile height is well below the third centile what is height age the height age is the age at which this present height is normal so 96 centimeter is normal for a three year six month old boy because at four year the height is 100 centimeter so three years around three and a half years 96 centimeter will be normal so his chronological age is nine year but his height age is three years six months how to plot in the how to get the height age in the growth chart so you can just draw a horizontal line and till it reaches the 50th centile and you can drop it down and see what is the age of the child so here it is exactly three year six months so that denotes that his chronological age is nine year but his height corresponds to a three year six month old boy and what is similarly you can calculate the weight age also the so roughly the weight is 20 kg so around a five year old boy will have weight of 20 kg so his weight age is five years so we can see in the growth chart you can just draw a horizontal line till it reaches the 50th centile and reach and you can see so this is a six year six year is the weight age so his height age is three years six months and his weight age is six year so how to how to interpret the height age and weight age and how uh, how to get a diagnosis suppose the child's weight is much more affected compared to height and height is also much affected compared to chronological age so height and weight are below the chronological age but weight is much more affected compared to height you can see the child in this photograph his height is less his weight is less but he is severely wasted his weight is much more affected compared to height so he will be having a nutritional course like protein energy malnutrition or he may be having chronic systemic illness like a congenital heart disease or cystic fibrosis or a malabsorption syndrome chronic renal disease so many conditions can produce severe wasting or he may be having a chronic infection like tuberculosis so weight will be much more affected compared to height in some cases height age and weight age will be less than chronological age but height will be much more affected compared to weight so in our child height is much more affected compared to weight so if the height is more affected compared to weight then you can think about endocrine causes like hypothyroidism growth hormone deficiency can produce height age much more affected compared to weight age and chronological age skeletal dysplasia achondroplasia you can get a child like this and some genetic causes like turner syndrome down syndrome you will get height age much more affected compared to weight age and chronological age in some condition height age will be more than the weight age and weight age will be more than chronological age both height and weight will be much more than chronological age but height will be much more he will be much more taller so the condition may be precocious puberty and some condition genetic conditions like marfan syndrome they will be very tall and height age will be more than chronological age in exogenous obesity weight age is much affected weight age weight age is much more affected compared to height height is much more affected compared to chronological age that is in exogenous obesity but in endocrine obesity and all that we will be discussing later height will be less so next is what is the mid parental height i know everybody knows how to plot the how to assess the mid parental height since he is a boy that is father's height father's height plus 13 whole divided by 2 that is 168.5 cm you can just plot it at the around 18 18 to 20 years you can just plot there so what is the, there is a mid parental range is there you can, roughly if it is one standard deviation that is 
six centimeter above or six centimeter below the mid parental height is the mid parental range that is six centimeter above that one seventy four point five centimeter and one sixty two point five centimeter. So it just you can plot the height of this child through along with the growth chart. It is not very it is just straight line, but it should be almost like this growth chart. Anyway, you can see that his height will be. 140 cm around 18 years that is much below the mid parental range so he is not having familial short stature in familial short stature this his projected height will be between the mid parental range that is much below so we have to investigate this child an upper segment lower segment ratio is 1 is to 1 so a 9 year old boy that is normal so that is called as proportionate dwarfism You can see that bone age is three years. Bone age is much below, even below the height. So you can how to plot the bone age around the this is the three year, and just along the same straight line of the height, you can just plot. Just add an into mark or a triangular mark. So here, height is much more affected compared to chronological age and weight, and the bone age is very much delayed. The bone age is only three years. So you have to investigate definitely for endocrine cause in this child. So this is the body proportions. Normal ratio at birth is 1.7 is to 1. Six months it is 1.6 is to 1. One year it is 1.5 is to 1. Around six to ten year it will be 1 is to 1. So this child is having proportionate short stature. So here we are having now the body proportion, upper segment, lower segment ratio. Indian charts are available. This is prepared by Dr. Vaman Kadilkar and group. So this is an Indian chart for boys and girls. You can see that this is if it is above 97th percentile, the upper segment is more than the lower segment. If it is below third centile, the lower segment is more than the upper segment. So so if it is above 97 or below third centile, that child is abnormal. Or if it is above two standard deviation or below two standard deviation, that child will be abnormal. So always plot in the chart. And if the discrepancy between upper segment and lower segment is more than two standard deviation, or outside third or ninety seventh percentile, then it is significant. The the concept of sitting height, sitting height, you can just usually in the upper segment lower segment ratio, you will measure the height, measure the lower segment, and then subtract the lower segment from the height to get the upper segment. This is just the opposite. In the sitting position, you can take the height. A sitting height of the child from the head to this shield tuber. So this is this is the sitting height, and you can subtract the height of the stool from uh, and the so upper segment. The total height minus the upper segment will be the lower segment. Here sitting height is measured, and we can subtract from the total height to get the lower segment. The values are same. So we have Indian. Percent sitting height percentiles in three to seventeen year old Indian children. There are studies are there. So Dr. Khad, Ram Vaman Kadilkar and his group has done lot of studies in this upper uh, sitting height percentiles. So based on the upper segment and lower segment ratio, you can divide the child the short stature into two: proportionate short stature and disproportionate short stature. Proportionate short stature the most commonest is the familial short stature. Parents are Short, and the height potentially is also less in a child, so that is familial short stature. In second common is constitutional delay in growth and puberty, in which parents are tall, but there will be some delayed puberty in the history of the parent. If you take the history of the parents, delayed puberty in may both male and female, and this child also will grow in a lowest percentile, but he will catch up. During the puberty, that is constitutional delay in growth and puberty. Then endocrine causes like hypopituitarism, hypothyroidism, undernutrition. If you ask me, which is the commonest cause of pathological cause of stunting, that may be undernutrition. Even if in Indian children, even if the child is having a growth hormone deficiency, there may be associated undernutrition, either macronutrient deficiency or micronutrient deficiency like iron, calcium, vitamin D, zinc, and all these things. So we have to rule out both. Then systemic diseases we have to rule out cardiac disease, renal disease, respiratory problems, GIT problems, all these things before 
going for investigation of an endocrine causes. An IUGR, at least 10% of the low birth weight babies, STA babies will remain short even after 4 years. Disproportionate short stature is either short limb dwarfism like skeletal dysplasia, like achondroplasia and related diseases and conditions like rickets, there will be short limb dwarfism or it child may be having short trunk dwarfism when upper segment is less than lower segment that is seen in mucopolysaccharidosis, kyphosis and some uh, skeletal dysplasia, but there will be up, uh, upper segment will be short. So, these are the investigation. So, you have to, you, you need not do all this test in all children. So, you have to select the cases. Usually, if the child comes to the our OPD for evaluation of short stature, the basic investigation you can do in all children like CBC, ESR, urine routine, stool routine and OVA, calcium, phosphorus, alkaline phosphates, blood urea, serum creatinine to rule out renal disease, random blood sugar and liver function plus is at least SGPT, electrolyte and thyroid function testers I have put it level 1 because the, the newborn thyroid screening program is not universal in our country. So, many children will be missing and we are having a very good number of cases of autoimmune thyroiditis also. So, thyroid function test also can be done in the initial visits itself. Then level 2 investigation when it is an area of where celiac disease is very common, you can do a tissue transglutaminase. Then all girl child you have to do a karyotypic to rule out Turner syndrome and even in a male child or any child with some dysmorphic features, you have to do just genetic studies you can do. Level 3 is mainly after all these conditions you can see if, if you think that the child is having an endocrine problem or growth hormone deficiency. So, you have to do growth hormone stimulation test, IGF-1, IGF binding proteins and MRI also. This is the list of investigation in a child. Bone age is a very important thing to do. So, many diseases can be diagnosed by a carefully done bone age and careful uh, how, uh, careful examination of the bone age. How to assess bone age? Previously, we used to assess by n minus 1, number of carpal bones minus 1. That is not a good, uh, uh, good measurement. So, the carpal bones are little bit difficult to because in different children, there will be different time of appearance of carpal bones. So, it is very difficult based on just based on carpal bones to assess the bone age. So, the most, most commonly used one is Grulix and Pile Atlas. We will compare with the Grulix and Pile Atlas and most sense, most specific is Tanner and Whitehouse method, but that is little bit cumbersome. So, in a busy OPD, we cannot do a Tanner Whitehouse, but in some research purpose and all, Tanner Whitehouse will be better than Grulix and Pile Atlas. Then there are software based methods are available now like Bone Expert. So, if the bone age corresponds to chronological age, shell is having familial short stature. That means that in familial short stature, the bone age corresponds to chronological age. If his age is 9 year, bone age is also 9 year. So, if you are thinking that the parents are very short and the child is also short, but bone age is delayed, you are not dealing with a case of familial short stature because at least one or both parents may be having some endocrine problem and this child also may be having some endocrine problem. So, bone age is delayed, you have to investigate. Bone age will be slightly delayed, a, at least one or two year delay in constitutional short stature, chronic systemic illness, undernutrition. In chronic, in constitutional short stature, bone age will correspond to height age. Bone age will be severely delayed in hypopituitarism and hypothyroidism and all these endocrine causes. Bone age will be advanced in precocious puberty. Precocious puberty, initially there will be height increment, when, but the bone fuses and the child stop increasing his height and finally he will be having short stature. So, this is how to assess the bone age. The chronological age of this child is 5 year. What is his bone age? Just look at the x-ray provided. This is you can see here this is x-ray of wrist, but usually you have to take x-ray of the hand, whole hand. You can see that here you can see the distal end of the radius and ulna, that space is there, carpal bones are there proximal meta, this metacarpals are there, with, with very difficulty you can see the proximal phalanges, 
middle and distal phalanges are not there in the x-ray and the, all the details of the patient is there in the x-ray. So, it is, it is a poorly taken x-ray as far as our bone age assessment is concerned. Anyway, we can, this is just to show you that this is not the type of x-ray you should take. You should take x-ray of the whole hand. So, you can open the Grulix and Pile Atlas. So, this is a 5 year old boy. So, you can see this is the 5 year old boy in the Grulix and Pile Atlas. Look at his bone age. He, this present child's bone age is less than uh, the same child of the child of the same age, 5 year. You can see the distal end of the radius. Distal end of ulna is not there in both the x-rays. Distal end of the radius, you can see this is more mature compared to our child. There are 4 carpal bones are there. Here there are 4 carpal bones, little bit more advanced and one more carpal bone is here. And this is very difficult, but still you can see here the, met, the epiphysis of the phalanges and metacarpals are slightly advanced compared to this child. So, here the bone age is definitely less than 5 year. So, you can take 4 year. 4 year if you take here also the radius is much more advanced, the radius is much more mature. 4 carpal bones, one small speck of the 5th carpal bone is there. Here also you can see that the metacarpals are little bit more advanced compared to our index cell. So, his bone age is less than 4 year. You can take 3 year carpal, I think radius is normal, but carpal bones, there are 3 carpal bones only. Here, there are 4 carpal bones and this part, the distance of these metacarpals and phalanges are less, almost similar or slightly less mature compared to our index cell. So, he is definitely, his age is definitely more than 3 year bone age. So, his bone age is between 3 and 4 years. So, that, that is how you can assess based on the Grulix and Pile Atlas. Now, this is the Tanner Whitehouse method. So, just what are the important points of the Tanner Whitehouse, I will tell you. There are some apps are there. You can, if you are interested, you can go, go and download the app and you can do the bone age assessment. In Tanner Whitehouse 3, the carpal bones are not at all used because that is little bit cumbersome. So, they are taken 13 regions of interest that is called as RUS score, radius, ulna and short bones. Only 13 regions and we will assess the maturity of these regions. So, you can see distal end of the radius, distal end of the ulna, you can metacarpal, head of the metacarpal, always make sure that head of the first metacarpal is in the distal part, not in the proximal part. If you do not know that, you will just count this as a carpal bone. Then the proximal phalanges 1, 3 and 5, middle phalanges 3 and 5, there is no middle phalanges in the thumb and distal phalanges 1, 3 and 5. So, you have to calculate the maturity of all these bones and finally add and see the bone age. For example, this is the radius. You can see in this child, what is the score of this radius? So, you can see the radius, this is not, A is no, there is no, there is no epiphysis, B is a small Dot, dot is there. So, you can go like this, it will be L, F, you can see that. So, F, there will be some number assigned to this F. So, all bones should be, we have to calculate the maturity and see the number, which number it belongs and you can add all these things and we will get the bone age. I am not going into detail because of the lack of time. So, this is in short how to assess bone age based on the Tanner Whitehouse method. So, you can go to the next question, you have to, you can note down the height and weight and all these things. This is a 5 year old boy, height is 97 centimeter, weight is 18 kg, came for evaluation of short stature. Then he has seen in the first OPD and he was asked to follow up after 4 months. Then after 4 months, his height is 99 centimeter, what is his height velocity? How will you interpret this result and how will you manage this child? So, height, height velocity is a very excellent indicator of the growth uh, of the linear growth status of the child. So, in some children, if the height is borderline, you can take the basic investigation and see, and after that, you can assess the growth velocity. You, you can come ask the child to come after four or five a particular time 
and you can assess the growth velocity. So here, the what is the height velocity? That is the height increment per year. Here, the child has increased three centimeter, two centimeter, ninety-seven centimeter, and now ninety-nine centimeter. Two centimeter in four months. So per in, in any, per year, his increment will be two into three, six centimeter. So his height velocity is six centimeter per year. So here you can see in the growth chart. This is the first visit. His height is ninety-seven centimeter. After four months, the this is his mid-parental height. After four months, this is ninety-nine centimeter. He is growing in the third centile. Almost his growth is like this. So ideally, you have to plot his measurement in the growth velocity chart. I will be showing that in the next slide. And if the growth velocity chart, the child should be evaluated. If the growth velocity is below twenty-fifth centile in the growth velocity chart, if growth velocity is good, more than twenty-fifth centile, he requires reassurance and periodic checkup of the height and weight. If there is a dip, then we can evaluate. Otherwise, we can just follow up the child because this is almost in the third centile. If he is having some constitutional delay in growth and puberty, at around puberty, he may increase his height. And almost reaches the mid-parental height. There is no need of uh, endocrine investigation at present in this child. So we can go to the growth velocity chart. This is the in Indian growth velocity chart, again prepared by Dr. Vaman Khadirkar sir and his group. You can see this is growth velocity chart in boys, growth velocity chart in girls. Here age in years, here growth velocity in years. So that is six centimeter per year, seven centimeter per year like that. This is the centiles. This is the 50th centile, and this is the 25th centile. If his growth velocity is below 25th centile, that indicates that his growth velocity is not good, and he requires follow-up or investigation. So here, his our our index child's growth velocity is 6 centimeter. Just we can plot it here. So that is between 50th centile and 25th centile. So we can reassure the child and ask the child to follow up, and we can take a serial growth measurements. That is the important of importance of growth velocity charts. The next question is: A four-year-old girl is having proportionate short stature. Her height is well below third centile, and having born age corresponding to one year six months. So height is below third centile. Born age is also delayed. Routine examination and thyroid function test are within normal limit. Karyotypic showed 46 XX. All girl child after rolling out nutritional courses and other things, you have to investigate. You have to do her karyotype because to rule out Turner syndrome because you won't get the stigmata of Turner syndrome in 100% of children. So if you take webbing of the neck, if you take heart disease, if you take a wide set uh, nipple, if you take Wide carrying angle, you will you you will get it in one third of the children, but short stature or the growth linear growth velocity loss will be seen in hundred percent of children. So there can be a child with Turner syndrome without any stigmata just coming to you with short stature. So always in any girl, karyotyping is a must. So this is the child's photograph. Is there any abnormality you can see? If you have found out the abnormality, you can put it in the chat box. So, so at least people has written single incisor, single incisor. Dr. Rama, Dr. Saurup, and there are fifteen messages are there. I will see midline defect, single center incisor, hypopituitarism, growth hormone deficiency. All these things are correct. So that indicates that tells you that you have to do the general examination very carefully. Then you will get. The diagnosis before investigation itself. So here, so the question is: any clue regarding the diagnosis from the given photograph? Mention four clinical features you will look for in favor of your diagnosis. List the investigation to confirm your diagnosis. What are the MRI findings which will support your diagnosis? And what are the management options? She has single upper central incisor that is seen in hypopituitarism. 
So other features suggestive of hypopituitarism is prominent forehead, depressed nasal bridge, mid-facial hyperplasia, midline cleft lip and cleft palate, micro penis, facial immaturity, doll-like facies, high-pitched voice, trunkal obesity. All these things are features of growth hormone deficiency. You can see this child is a diagnosed case of growth hormone deficiency. You can see his frontal bossing, very prominent eyes and mid facial hyperplasia and some of the features are there and how to investigate this child so here the specific investigation because here you have almost diagnosed growth hormone deficiency so you have how to confirm so here this is the pituitary this is growth hormone releasing hormone from hypothalamus this is growth hormone inhibitory hormone and pituitary from the somatotrophs the growth hormone is product produced and released to in the circulation so in the liver there is that goes to the liver through the bloodstream in the liver there is growth hormone receptor so liver produce igf1 insulin like growth factor 1 and insulin like growth factor binding proteins of which binding protein 3 is most important they will go together growth hormone igf1 and igf binding proteins and reaches the target tissues so the measurement of growth hormone IGF-1 and IGF binding proteins are essential. So how to measure the growth hormone? Just a basal level of growth hormone is not at all, uh, don't, should not be done. That is a wrong method of diagnosis. So if just if you give do a basal growth hormone secretion, that will be always low because the growth hormone is secreted in a pulsatile manner. So usually if you do a just a basal growth hormone level, you will get a very low value and you will wrongly diagnose growth hormone deficiency and just tell the parents that this child is having growth hormone deficiency and they will get confused and it will be a real problem. So you have to do growth hormone stimulation either using clonidine, levodopa, arginine or insulin. What we used to do is mainly we are using clonidine stimulation. So if the clonidine stimulation you can there will be an overnight fasting, child should be youth thyroid and if the child is adolescent, we have to prime with sex steroids, then you have to do in the morning basal in the empty stomach basal secretion, then give clonidine, then half an hour, one hour, one and a half, two hours, we can, you have to take serially growth hormone. The peak value, if it is less than 7 nanogram per ml, that is you are dealing with a case of severe growth hormone deficiency. And that is not 100% foolproof. You have, you should have your anthropometric data, your growth chart, and other Oxford, uh, other investigations that should be done before this growth hormone stimulation test. Then IGF-1 and IGF binding protein. IGF-1 is less than five years. If the child is malnourished, you will get a lower value. IGF binding protein is little bit more sensitive compared to IGF-1. Then the final will be the MRI brain. The classic tetrad of hypopituitarism is small cella, hypoplastic or absent pituitary gland, absent pituitary stalk, and ectopic posterior pituitary bright spot. These are the classical findings of the uh, hypopituitarism. So those with structural anomalies of hypothalamo pituitary regions are more likely to have multiple pituitary anomalies. In a child with isolated growth hormone deficiency, you can even get a normal MRI. Then comes the last one, the genetic testing. Now this is the era of exome sequencing and all, but I won't suggest genetic testing in all children to start treatment. That may be sometimes for academic interest. but. In some cases, you have to do some genetic testing that we have discussed karyotyping in a child with suspected Turner syndrome and Down syndrome. So suppose if the child is having short stature and if there is a family history of severe short stature, consanguinity and all, then that may be an indication of genetic testing. And associated malformations, complex phenotype, syndromic features are there, skeletal malformations, disproportionate short stature. If the child is having developmental delay, mental retardation, if the child is having advanced bone age, that is Akan syndrome or some syndromes with growth, uh, growth hormone deficiency can have 
advanced bone age that is extremely rare. So, these are the indications for genetic testing. So, you can see the careful physical examination will narrow down the differential diagnosis. You can just if you if you want to do the assessment you, you can just put it that put the diagnosis in the chat box you can you have seen or already you have seen this child you can see this child this is or this child is also having a prominent forehead mid facial hypoplasia and a doll like facies this child is having this child was diagnosed as having growth hormone deficiency his elder sibling a girl is also having growth hormone deficiency you can see this child this is a newborn came with micro penis so he have, he was having severe hypoglycemia intractable hypoglycemia in the newborn period micro penis and finally he diagnosed as having multiple pituitary hormone deficiency so this is a child we can child came for evaluation of short stature you can see a small thyroid gland enlarged thyroid gland here that child was having autoimmune thyroiditis this is called this is a madeleine deformity you can see a short third and fourth toe in this girl. This is diagnostic of either Turner syndrome or pseudo hypoparathyroidism. So, this is this child came with obesity and short stage. You can see that he is having some pe peculiar features of Prader Willi syndrome. This is a case of disproportionate short stature, came with bowing of the legs. He was having rickets. This is a case of Russell syndrome, Russell Silver syndrome. You can see that child is having a hemi hypertrophy of this child, a triangular face and prominent forehead. This child came with eval for evaluation of short stature and he was having aortic stenosis and the diagnosis is obvious and you can see his fa dysmorphic facial features, his genetic study, if Mohandas is there, he can remember this child, was diagnostic of Williams syndrome. Again, this child came with evaluation of short stature at the age of this girl child came for evaluation of short stature at 5 years but she was having some features of Turner's uh, he was not having any feature of Turner's syndrome but the diagnosis after karyotyping was Turner's syndrome but just after questioning the mother told me that child was having some edema in the feet in, during the newborn period and she gave me this photograph when the child was a new neonate or six month old child you can see a swelling here that subsided at around one year of age so that child was having some lymphedema and dorsum of the foot this child should have been diagnosed in the infancy itself but some somehow it, we miss the, miss such cases this child we have already seen child with protein energy malnutrition so you can see two siblings came for evaluation of short stature but they were very they thought actually that we can treat with growth hormone deficient with growth hormone and all but these children was having both of them were having rhizomelia and both are having achondroplasia this is a poor child with congenital hypothyroidism diagnosed at around 8 years of age they came with for evaluation of short stature but child was having mental retardation and all again if you if we have a newborn screening now we have a newborn screening if you have a newborn screening at least many of these children should have diagnosed in the newborn period itself this is a typical child of turner syndrome this is this child is nephrotic syndrome and child was getting steroid and steroid induced short stature you can see the midline cleft lip in this child so that was child also was having growth hormone deficiency so by careful examination of the head to foot examination, you can diagnose lot of things and that will give some clues regarding your final diagnosis. The management of growth hormone deficiency is recombinant growth, human growth hormone, the dose is 0.025 to 0.03 milligram per kilogram per day, a higher dose in conditions like Turner syndrome, you have to do monitor growth velocity, some adverse reactions like headache slipped capital femoral epiphysis, exaggeration of scoliosis, all these things are rare. Main indication for growth hormone growth hormone is growth hormone deficiency itself, then Turner syndrome, prader willi syndrome, SGA babies, idiopathic short stature, chronic renal failure, uh, then Russell Silver syndrome, all these things there are indications of 
growth hormone treatment and more and more new diseases are getting added in the list but the improvement in the height is much more commonly much more commonly seen in growth hormone deficiency so this is another case what is the sport diagnosis so this is a 6 year old boy came for evaluation of obesity he was born as a low birth weight hypotonic baby who required gavage feeding later he developed excessive appetite he had poor scholastic performance and now not going to school at all examination revealed a short boy with syndromic features has bilateral undescended testis his anthropometric measurements are as follows height 90 cm and weight 30 kg so uh, the question is plot his bmi in the given chart and comment second what are the pointers against the diagnosis of exogenous obesity what is the likely diagnosis list some differential diagnosis how will you confirm your diagnosis what are the management options so this is the bmi chart iap bmi chart you can see that this above 5 years you can plot the bmi and this is the third centile so you can see here an orange line that correspond to 23 adult equivalent so if the bmi is above this orange line the child is having overweight this is red line that is corresponds to 27 adult equivalent that is above this child is having obesity so you can see his bmi was calculated weight in kilogram by height in meter square bmi is 37 so just i plot the bmi so bmi is sky high so this child is obese so you can go to the other growth chart i am plotting his weight and height so you can see that weight is above 97 centile but height is below 3rd centile so this is not a case of exogenous obesity in case of exogenous obesity the height will be more than expected actually it will be more than our 50th centile or more than the mid parental height related standards so child will be tall and obese here child is short and obese so you have to investigate this child so i will go to the chat box diagnosis is prader willi syndrome everybody has written prader willi diagnosis fish managed with growth hormone therapy okay very good so the pointers against the diagnosis of exogenous obesity is one short stature second developmental delay third is dysmorphic facial features undescended testis hearing and visual defects if any of these things are there you are not dealing with a case of exogenous obesity what are the genetic causes of short stature prader willi syndrome baden beidel syndrome cohen syndrome rohad carpenter syndrome and there is endocrine causes also like cushing syndrome hypothyroidism even growth hormone deficiency can produce some amount of overweight and there is some monogenic causes like leptin deficiency melanocortin 4 receptor mutation pomc defect so these causes very early onset obesity it is not as rare as you think at least nowadays with the advent of the exome sequencing and all we can we are diagnosing more and more cases of monogenic obesity the prader willi syndrome is one of the common causes of genetic causes of obesity that will manifest with neonatal hypotonia failure to thrive in infancy then hyperphagia hypogonadism mental retardation that is because of the partial deletion of chromosome 15 q11 and 13 there is a paternal inheritance paternal deletion and it is characterized by very high levels of ghrelin baden beidel syndrome retinitis pigmentosa polydactyly hypogonadism cohen syndrome that is having prominent maxillary incisors and rohad rapid onset of obesity with hypothalamic dysfunction hypoventilation and autonomic dysregulation 
So this is our own child with the Prader Belly syndrome, and you can see this child with obesity. Child is having polydactyly. This may be a case of Bardet Biedl syndrome. This is child was diagnosed as having Cushing syndrome, and child was having adrenal tumor. This is not our own cases. Cohen syndrome and Carpenter syndrome. There is one group of monogenic obesity. Monogenic obesity, the birth weight will be normal, and there will be morbid obesity in infancy. Child will be having severe hyperphagia and delayed puberty. So there will be the defect in the leptin melanocortin pathway. That is the thing. So this is the leptin melanocortin pathway. This is adipocytes. Adipocytes, the leptin is produced. In the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, this is called as leptin receptor that will stimulate pro-opio melanocortin, POMC that can produce MSH alpha beta MSH. The MSH will stimulate melanocortin 4 receptor, and alpha MSH can stimulate melanocortin 1 receptor that will produce hyperpigmentation. So whenever this is damaged, pigment child will be having blonde appearance. And POMC stimulate uh, this from this cleave ACTH that will stimulate MC2R melanocortin 2 receptor and the deficiency can produce cortisol deficiency, hypoglycemic, cortisol, adrenal crisis, hypoadrenalism. This MSH can produce melanocortin 3 and melanocortin 4 receptor, of which melanocortin 4 receptor is more prominent. Upon stimulation, in the, this is in the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. That will decrease the food intake and increase the energy expenditure. That will prevent obesity. So here, if the child is having leptin deficiency, so this whole uh, that pathway is damaged. So there will be increased food intake and decreased energy expenditure in the very early childhood and producing a morbid obesity like this. Another thing is leptin receptor deficiency. When a, that also can produce morbid monogenic obesity. POMC deficiency can produce obese, uh, monogenic obesity with adrenal crisis and blonde appearance, hypopigmented body. Then melanocortin 4 receptor mutation is there. That is supposed to be the commonest among this MC4R mutation. All these things can produce morbid obesity. And now the set melanotide is the treatment option for MC for our receptor mutation and all other uh, other monogenic obesity. So leptin can produce if the leptin will produce agouti related protein and NPY that will get stimulated that also will decrease the food intake and increase the energy expenditure. So this is a monogenic obesity. So in short, if the child is having obesity, take a detailed history and physical examination. If it is normal, we are dealing with a case of exogenous obesity. If it is abnormal, if the child is having poor growth velocity, look for endocrine, you have to do endocrine evaluation. If the child is having some dysmorphic facial features, hearing defect, visual defect, hyperphagia, developmental anomalies, you have to do a genetic evaluation, karyotyping and in if you are suspecting Prader-Willi DNA methylation studies and all. But here also there will be poor growth velocity. If there is a CNS injury like past history of meningitis, encephalitis and all and child is having obesity later, it may be hypothalamic obesity, do an MRI and see the, whether there is a structural problem. If the child is having early onset obesity in infancy, child may be having monogenic obesity like leptin, POMC or MC4 or receptor mutation. If there is a history of chronic drug intake like anti-cytocortic steroids and all, that may be a child may be having a drug-induced obesity. So these are the red flag signs of abnormal obesity. One is poor growth velocity, developmental delay, dysmorphism, hearing defect, visual defects. So here, this child, this is prader willi syndrome clinically, that is. That is no, no more uh, answers in the chat box. prader willi syndrome is caused by deletion of paternal chromosome 15, 15Q11 
to Q13 or maternal uriparental disomy of chromosome 15. The preferred method of testing is methylation analysis which detect more than 99% of cases including all genetic subtypes, deletion, uniparental disomy or imprinting mutation. And here after diagnosis Prader-Willi, you have to do a sleep study to see whether the child is having sleep apnea or not because there are some studies that showed growth hormone can produce harm in a child with sleep, uh, sleep apnea and all. And you have to look for his hearing, vision and all these things. And finally, the growth hormone therapy will improve the height and reduce the obesity in child, children with <coughs> prader belly syndrome. In short, the take home message <coughs> is growth monitoring, growth monitoring, growth monitoring. <coughs> then if you suspect some endocrine problem or abnormality, then you can do an early referral for initiating treatment. So the, the basics of endo, pediatric endocrinology is growth monitoring and plotting the uh, height, weight and all this measurement in the growth chart and assessing the growth velocity and then assessing, assessing the body, body mass index and plotting again, plotting in the growth chart. And if you know how to plot the growth chart and growth velocity chart, at least 50% of your endocrine cases you can reasonably you can diagnose. Thank you. This is the first series. So, if the time permits, we can take the second and third part at a later time. Sabik. Hello. Hello, Mondas. Ah. Uh, 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 okay. Okay. Uh, Sabik. Uh, sir. Uh, any, can we take few questions if needed? Any doubts if you have, you can either ask directly or you can write in the chat box. Thank you, Shaila Madam, for joining. <laughs> Our Pediatric Endocrinology National Endocrinology President Dr. Shaila Madam is here. Madam, I have seen you. One second. Shaila Madam, you are muted, Madam. It was a good recapitulation of all the things. It was wonderful talk. I enjoyed a lot. Thank you very much. Congratulations and happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you, Madam. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Madam. <laughs> This is only basics this time. No, no, but it's it's good. That's what we want, no? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, madam, for attending this session. Thank you very much. Any questions or doubts? If there are no questions, uh, I think we will wind up the session. Uh, so it was a, a very, very crisp and clear uh, uh, session on short stature, how to plot growth chart, how to interpret that, how to interpret born age. And usually you get a lot of questions based on this and uh, uh, this will really help you uh, in your exams. And uh, I think you should pass the message to your colleagues so that uh, uh, more of your colleagues uh, will be able to attend this session in the coming weeks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vijay Kumar, uh, for uh, uh, taking the class here. And uh, there will be further sessions on pediatric endocrinology and also on various other uh, chapters in uh, pediatrics. Uh, thank you all for attending. We'll close the session. Thank you. Thank you, Mohanjas. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Darli, madam, is also here. Thank you, madam, for attending. If you have any comments, you can make now. No comments. Darlene. Actually, I enjoyed the session very well. Right from the beginning, I was there. Okay. Thank you, madam. Thank you.
Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.